So, let's see, where are we? Uh, you've turned in the homework on norms. One comment is that, you know, the whole business of me going over everything uh, for the case where matrices and vectors are complex valued is mostly for completeness. And I had meant to announce that if you want to just do the homework for real valued matrices and vectors, until we get to eigenvalues, that's just fine. Okay, so if you want to just simplify the problem and just work on it as if these are real values and complex, but I mean, make a note. I'm going to do this for real value problems instead and then move on with your life, okay? And notice that the Hermitian transpose then becomes a... Can, can, can what be lowered? Louder. Can I be louder? Yeah. Oh, gosh, I thought I was loud, but I guess not loud enough. Maybe this place doesn't have the right acoustics. I'm sorry. Anyway, you're free to, to do things in real arithmetic, so... Um, until further notice. I guess I was kind of mumbling there. I'm sorry. Um, and please do make those kind of comments because if you guys can't hear me, the world can't hear me, right? Uh, okay, so, you know, norms are very important because it's going to allow us to make statements about how close vectors and matrices are to the real result uh, because, again, we introduce error as we do our computation, and we're going to get into that later in the semester. Are there any questions about uh, those notes and or the problem sets? So, we move on to the extremely important topic of the singular value decomposition. What I'm hoping to do, now we have two lectures to finish this up, so, uh, we'll be okay. I've written notes on this that I'll post this afternoon. Uh, they're a little terse, maybe, but hopefully between the rather terse notes and the, you know, very lively lectures that I give, you'll get it, right? Or at least I'm alive. That's <laughs> the singular value decomposition. Okay, let's start by asking how many of you have run into an application of the singular value decomposition already? Ah, just a few of you. The rest of you is not willing to admit it or doesn't realize you did, maybe. Okay, so can you enlighten us? What was the application? In fact, uh, I had a equation which I couldn't solve in the new decomposition, so the issue solved the single. Ah. So you needed a highly accurate solution probably to an ill-conditioned problem and the LU factorization fell apart. Okay, so that's one application of it. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, we're trying to learn a data-dependent projection metric. Okay. So you're, you're in, in, in data mining of sorts? or? Okay, yeah. So, so it turns out uh, we use it as an initial guess. Okay. So the singular value decomposition is uh, extremely important. And we're, I'm going to try to mix a rather theoretical introduction to it. This, after all, is a math class with uh, trying to give you a feel for what's going on with trying to show you an actual application of it to data compression, OK? And hopefully, between all of that, we'll get it, OK? Um, you know, it may be a bit of a shock that we're already talking about the singular value decomposition in the, what, the fourth lecture, given that in a typical class, often this is the last thing that's presented at the end of the uh, semester, and then you have one lecture to kind of fit it in, and um, it just doesn't get the right justice. If, you know, the point is, this, this is important. Pay attention, right? Now... Before we can talk about the singular value decomposition, we have to talk about a special kind of matrix that are known as unitary matrices. Okay. Now, what's a unitary matrix? Well, first of all, we know that if two vectors x and y are of length m, of size m, 
I tried to use size for the number of entries in the vector and length for the actual Euclidean length, okay? But sometimes I mess up. Then these two vectors are orthogonal or perpendicular if their dot product is equal to zero. Okay, you've certainly seen the real uh, values equivalent of this already. And if not, you may want to go and read the notes that we created for this massive open online course. Now, what do we like to do? We like to take matrices and we like to slice and dice them. And if we think of these matrices, this particular matrix as a collection of columns, then Q has mutually orthonormal columns. If, well, first of all, QI Hermitian QJ is equal to 1 if I is the same as J and 0 otherwise. Okay? So now we have a collection of vectors. And if you take any pair of vectors, if they're not the same vector, they're orthogonal to each other. What is an example of such a collection of vectors? Basis. Unit basis vectors, right? But, you know, in 2D, you could take the vectors 1, 0, and 0, 1. But you could also take a vector, something or other, of length 1, and another one that's perpendicular to it, and you would get a set of mutually orthogonal vectors. Now, a very convenient way of saying that the columns of Q are mutually orthonormal is to say that Q Hermitian Q is equal to the identity. Okay? And why is that? Because if you take Q and, and take its Hermitian transpose, you take all of its columns and make them into rows. And if you multiply that times Q0, Q1, through Qn minus 1, you simply get the matrix that consists of the entry Q0, Hermitian Q0, Q0, Hermitian Q1, etc., and Q1, Hermitian Q0, uh, Q1, Hermitian Q1. And what you notice is that on the diagonal, the i and the j are equal, so those are equal to 1. And off the diagonal, they're all equal to 0 if Q Hermitian Q equals to the identity. Okay? Um, so this is a very convenient way of stating that the matrix has mutually orthonormal columns. And again, anytime I see a matrix, the first thing I try is to think of the matrix in terms of its columns. Yes? Q n by n. Q, in this case, is actually m by n. So that's a good question, OK? So in this case, I'm taking Q to be m by n. Was that your question as well, Paul? No, I was just going to say, if Q has, uh, so, so that property is true if and only if Q has well, we mutually want the column. Correct. It's the definition of okay. the orthonormal. Okay. Yeah. Are the, the, the row slicing? Should that end on Q Hermitian N minus 1? No, because what we did was we took the N columns oh, and we made them into the rows. Okay. Very okay. good. Any other questions? So wouldn't that mean any matrix if it has numbers, those two matrices are uh, unitary? We're not to unitary matrices yet. We haven't defined them yet. Oh, okay. But so when we get to that, you can make that comment. Okay. okay? So, the very special case where Q is square so that it has M columns. <coughs> 
it's still the case that this is equal to the identity, but now we have m of them, right? In this particular case, q is said to be unitary. Sometimes people use the term orthogonal, especially if q is actually real value. Okay, so now we have a square matrix such that Q Hermitian Q is the identity. And what we then, of course, notice that is that that means that this is also equal to inverse. After all, it's the matrix that undoes the transformation that Q stands for. And what that, of course, also means is that Q times Q Hermitian is equal to the identity which is not true if matrix Q is not square, because if matrix Q is, has fewer columns than it has rows, then uh, it can't have an inverse, right? And this would mean that it would have an inverse. So anyway, you get the point. All right, so these are unitary matrices. Now, what makes unitary matrices, that answers your comment, right? Yeah. Okay, what makes unitary matrices so uh, important? Well, one way to think of the unitary matrix is as follows. <clears throat> if we have a vector x, we can think of it as the linear combination of the unit basis vectors. Right? Which is just <coughs> uh, chi 0 times E0 plus chi 1 times E1 and so forth. What does that really mean? That means that if x is equal to its individual components, then these are the coordinates in the standard coordinate system that we like to use in n dimensions. Right? But we don't need to use that coordinate system. And intuitively, using some coordinate system, but keeping that coordinate system to, have, to, to be mutually orthonormal is just a nice thing, right? Because it's like taking this and kind of maybe rotating it, but you may have to mirror it. And it's nasty. So how can we think of that, and how does that relate to unitary matrices. Well, if you start with your vector x, obviously you can multiply it by the identity. But multiplying by the identity is also the same as multiplying by q, q Hermitian, because we said that q Hermitian is the <coughs> inverse of q if that's what you started with, right? And let's again take our Q and let's partition it into columns. This is what Van der Guijn does. He takes matrices, he partitions them into columns. What do we have here? Well, this is the same as Q partitioned by columns times Q partitioned by columns but now transposed so that the columns become rows. Not really transpose, right? It's the Hermitian transpose. But if you take this matrix and multiply that, all you do is take inner products of the row with the vector to create the entries. So that's Q0 through Qn minus 1 times the vector Q0 trans uh, Hermitian transpose x. Q1 Hermitian transpose X through Q. This should have been M, right? So we're taking square matrices. And that's just this vector times that plus this vector times that, etc. And then we can bring the scalar up front. And what you get is Q0 Hermitian X 
times q0 plus q1 Hermitian x times q1, etc. Now, what does that mean? That means that if you take q1 through qm minus 1 to be the basis, the orthonormal basis for your m dimensional space, then the coordinates, the coefficients as expressed in that coordinate system are given by the transformed vector Q Hermitian X. Okay. In other words, multiplying X by Q Hermitian is the same as doing a change of basis to a new orthonormal. Basis. And this is going to become very, very important when we talk about the single value decomposition later and why it's such a magical thing. All right? Now, if you're uncomfortable working with bases and all that, again, you may want to go back to the notes that we have for the massive open online course, and hopefully you'll get a little bit more practice with that in a slightly simpler setting. I'm going 100 miles an hour here, but I'll try to talk you through this. Any questions about this? All right. So then we move on. Let's see. What else is important about unitary matrices? Let's see where my other notes are. OK, there's a couple more important things. And these are all homework exercises. But if you have a Q0 that's unitary, and you have a Q1 that are unitary, and they're both m by m, then notice that Q0 times Q1 is also unitary. And that's just a matter of working through the definition of what is a unitary matrix. Okay, I'll leave this as an exercise. What does this, of course, mean if you take k unitary matrices and multiply them all together? You get a unitary matrix, right? Yes? You mentioned how long is this due in two days? Good question. No, this is due next week. Okay. Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Good question. Um, so notice that we have two lectures for the signal value decomposition, so that's a convenient thing. However, doing the early part of the homework early on will make it so that you will understand Thursday's lecture better. So you're obviously you're encouraged to get started on this. Okay, so this is what you need to know about unitary matrices, pretty much. The rest I'll sort of mention as we go along of, of why it's important. Now, let me next state what the singular value decomposition is, and let me try to relate this to what we just discussed. And then we will prove that the singular value decomposition actually exists, and we'll get into some of the uh, things that are very hard to see if you don't know the singular value decomposition and how simple they become if you do know the singular value decomposition. That's sort of the, the order of the lecture. Okay, right, so let's, let's have a look at that. Let me introduce the sing singular value decomposition first in a slightly simplified situation where we start with the square matrix. So let's take A and let's take it to be an M by M matrix. Okay? The miraculous thing is that then there exist unitary matrices U and V also square and diagonal matrix sigma such that A can be written as U times 
sigma times V Hermitian transpose. Okay, now it happens to be the case that the entries in sigma are actually real valued in order from largest to smallest along the diagonal, but that's a little technicality. Let's not get into that. Let's instead try to interpret what that means. <clears throat> Um, well, let's start by looking at y is equal to a times x. Um, if you're given matrix A, you can compute this, right? What's a little harder to compute is x is equal to a inverse times y, which is the application for which you need it, right? Um, because inverting a matrix is nasty sometimes, right? Uh, we have Gaussian elimination. We know how to do this, but it turns out sometimes that doesn't work so well. And anyway, it's hard to say things about A inverse given A. So let's have a look. From this, we know, okay, I should give myself some space. What if we do a change of basis? Okay, here we have y expressed in terms of our unit basis vectors. Same thing for x. What if instead we express our vector y using the columns of u as the basis for its space cm. And what if we um, use, I need to get this right, y is equal to a times x. Let me cheat. Let me look. <sighs> yeah, I don't know where it is. Let me is it reason through this. Excuse me? We're going to take okay. what we're going to do. We're not going to prove this. That's going to be the rest of this lecture and next lecture. Okay? What I'm going to, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to interpret what does this mean, okay? Oh, and I did it right. We know that y, so what I'm saying is, look, multiplying a times x is the, the basic transformation with which linear algebra deals, okay? What I'm going to try to do is show that if you just think about your vectors y and x in a different orthonormal basis, then everything becomes so much simpler. Okay? And the orthonormal basis that you should be thinking in terms of are the columns of u and the columns of v. And then I'll show you a picture of how to geometrically interpret this to try to sort of drive this home. Okay? So, what do we know? We know that we can express y in terms of the columns of u. That's what we just talked about when we had a unitary matrix q. And we said, look, if you just look at q, q Hermitian x, then the coefficients in the vector q Hermitian x are the coefficients in this other basis for our f. Okay. We can do the same thing for x, and we can say, let's make that um, v, v Hermitian transpose. So let's call this here y hat. Okay. And let's call this here x hat. Notice that y hat and x hat are simply the coordinates in our change coordinate system for y and x 
perspective. Short Okano with me? I'll try to make this clearer in 2D shortly. What do we know about Y hat and X hat? Well, notice that we also have that this, is, that this here is equal to U sigma V Hermitian transpose. Right? What does V Hermitian transpose V equals? That's the identity, right? Now let's write this out. We get U sigma V Hermitian V V Hermitian, well, X. And we get that U times Y hat is equal to U sigma V Hermitian V times x hat. This here is the identity. And notice that because u is a square matrix, we can actually hit both sides with q Hermitian, because that's the inverse. And what we conclude is that y hat is equal to sigma times x hat. Instead. Now, why is that significant? Sigma is diagonal. Sigma is diagonal. Diagonal matrices are wonderful, right? <coughs> this here is just the diagonal matrix sigma 0, sigma 1 through sigma n minus 1 times the coordinates chi 0 hat chi 1 hat through chi n minus 1 hat. Zero is on the off diagonals. And if you do a diagonal matrix times a vector, what happens to the entries in the vector? They're scaled. They're simply scaled. easier to deal with than multiplying by matrix A. So what does the singular value trans uh, the singular value decomposition tell you? It tells you think in terms of the right orthonormal basis and the transformation A times X becomes much simpler, namely the multiplication with a diagonal matrix instead. That's the good news. The bad news is, computing the singular value decomposition is really complex. It's a non-trivial thing. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to give you an algorithm for computing it in the next two lectures. That's not going to come until the end of the lecture, uh, at the end of the semester, because we simply won't have the mechanisms yet to compute it until then. Which is actually not part. I'm going to give you a theoretical algorithm for computing it. That is just not a practical algorithm. So in theory, we can compute it. In practice, we won't be able to compute it until the end of the semester. Or rather, in practice, we won't be able to approximate it until the end of the semester. OK. Uh, yes? Just to interfere for it, how uh, uh, expensive an operation it is for an M cross N for, for computing the SPD? It's very expensive. Yeah, it's horrendously expensive. OK? But I could throw this back at you. You know, these kinds of applications come in chemistry, they come in physics, they come in data mining, etc. And all I need to say is, look, you brilliant mathematicians, do your math in the right basis, and everything is trivial to compute. So just go and do your brilliant math, and do everything in the right basis, for Pete's sake. Okay? Unfortunately, that's very difficult to do as well. But that way, it's your fault, not mine. <laughs> okay, so let's try to clarify this with a picture, and let's go back to um, 2D. So I have a sequence of pictures that are in the notes. Um, 
Uh, this is annoying because I can't control very well what's going on here. Let's see if we can do this. Let's turn this off. What do we have here? Obviously, looking at a times x, we can constrict ourselves to the case where the two norm of x is equal to 1 because all other vectors are then just uh, stretched versions of those x's, and if we know what happens to the unit ball, we know what happens to everything else. Right? So, we start on the left here with the unit ball, and what we're saying is, let's take A, which can be expressed as U sigma V Hermitian transpose, and let's take our U, and let's think of it as two columns, because we're working in 2D. And let's think of V as two columns, because we're working in 2D. Those are our bases. And notice that what we're saying is that um, the input X to A times X, you should think of in terms of the orthonormal basis V0, V1. And the output of A, Y, you should think of as in terms of the unit, the orthonormal basis U0, U1. So here's, on the left, is the domain of A, the input. And I have drawn some arbitrary V0 and V1 there. Notice that they're orthogonal. And similarly, in the output, which is also R2, I have drawn U0 and U1. And you'll notice that other than that, on the right, they are orthogonal. On the left, they are orthogonal. There's nothing magic about things pointing in the same direction. You know, they can point in any direction you want. OK? Um. If you now look at what happens when you do a times x, notice that all you really care about is how the vectors v0 and v1 are transformed into the vectors uh, a times v0 and a times v1. And what we just argued is that for those vectors, all that happens is that they are, uh, well, V0 is transformed into U0, but stretched. That's what the argument we just made says. And V1 is transformed into U1, except stretched. That's where the diagonal matrix comes in. And that's what you see on the right. So doing A times V1 is the same as stretching U1. Doing A times V0 is the same as stretching u0, right? And what if, now? If you now look at any vector x on the unit ball, notice that x can be written as a linear combination of v0 and v1. That's where the alpha 0 and alpha 1 come. A times x, then, is the same linear transformation, because it's a linear transformation. It's the same linear combination, is what I should say, because it's a linear transformation, of the transformed vectors a times v0 and a times v1. Okay. That's what you have on the right. And what it says, therefore, is that the unit ball is transformed into this ellipse as you sweep around the unit ball. Obviously, this calls for a nice animation. If I had been really energetic over the weekend, I would have created that animation. I wasn't that angry. <laughs> All right? And that's in the single value decomposition, illustrated in full color for the 2D case. And it turns out that 
lots of things you can do with the singular value e decomposition very easily that are hard to do in general. For example, um, if you know that A is equal to U sigma V Hermitian transpose, and this is non singular, in other words, it has an inverse, then A inverse, you can easily show, is just V times sigma inverse times U Hermitian transpose. And why is that? Well, look at A times A inverse. That's equal to U sigma V Hermitian V sigma inverse U Hermitian. This is the identity. This is the identity. This is the identity. Did I do that right? Yeah. No. Yes. Yes. Good. Sometimes I wonder about myself. All right. So if you can compute the singular value decomposition, then solving AX equals B is trivial. It's a, it's a sequence of matrix vector multiplications. The problem is computing the singular value decomposition is extraordinarily expensive. And therefore, under most circumstances, you're better off computing it some other way. Okay. Most of the time, the singular value decomposition is actually more of a uh, theoretical system. Okay. Yes? I'm sorry? Why, why it is called singular value? Why is it called the singular value is the question. So the, why is it called the singular value decomposition? Well, the, the, uh, the cheat's way out is to say if you take sigma and you write it as the diagonal matrix, these entries are called the singular values. Of course, that then says, well, why, do you, why are they called the singular values? <laughs> um, so this is where I fall short as a scholar, in that um, I don't show enough curiosity to delve into these kinds of things. Uh, and this is in part because when I do delve into these things, I promptly forget. Uh, for example, I'm going to know very few of your names at the end. I apologize. I'm just really, really, really bad with names. Okay. I remember Cole's name so far, but that's only because he's taken a class from me before. Or maybe two. Or maybe three. I don't know. Just one? Okay. okay. Singular values. Now, we could guess at this, because what do you suppose happens if... Now, these are in order from largest to smallest, what do you suppose happens if the last one happens to be zero? It's not, it's not hard to see that then you have a singular matrix. So it's certainly the case that these values tell you something about whether the matrix is singular. Um, and the other thing is, even if all of these are non-zero, after all, we're going to be computing in the presence of Randolph error, and therefore the chances that when you compute a singular valid decomposition, the singular valid decomposition has exact zeros on the diagonal is minuscule. How close to zero these values are telling you something about how close a matrix is to being a singular matrix, which turns out to be very, very good. So there are all kinds of insights like that that you can get from the singular value decomposition. Okay? So these are all good questions. Um, what do people use this for? Uh, next week, I'm going to show you how it can be used to do data compression. Let's see here. Let's do a preview. If we start with a picture, anybody know who that is? Frida. That's Frida Kahlo, right? Who is a Mexican uh, painter in the 1930s through 60s, I think. Famous Mexican communist. Ooh, gosh. I put a picture of a communist up there. <laughs> 
Texas state legislature is not going to like this, I can tell you that. Anyway, essentially, when you have your singular value decomposition, these are in order from largest to smallest. And what you can do is you can say, well, what happens if we just set a whole bunch of these equal to zero? Notice that then actually you end up only needing a couple of columns of u and a couple of columns of v to store this because everything else is hit with zeros. We'll see that next lecture. If you wipe all of them out, you end up with a rank one matrix because you end up approximating a with u zero, sigma zero, uh, v zero uh, transpose because this is real data. So this is a vector times a scalar, which you can bring out times a row vector. So that's a rank one matrix. And if you do that, then you get that lovely picture of this artist, which I think she would have appreciated, right? <laughs> um, if you, by the way, if you go on Wikipedia and look up selfie, I think that she is credited to sort of being one of the first people to be into selfies because she, she made lots of pictures of herself. Okay. If instead you use two of the single sides, then you get this approximation right here. So I'm just looking at the matrix of pixels as the matrix and I'm approximating this. And something's starting to come out. By the time you get to five, I think you can recognize someone. And by the time you get to 25, uh, the picture is pretty clear. Okay, and this takes about 8,000 entries to store, while the original took almost 200,000 entries to store. So there's a huge compression in uh, what you need to store. And what it goes to show is that the singular value decomposition can be used to approximate the matrix. Okay. Often, if it's the case that there is noise, then the noise shows up as small singular values, and you can throw those away, and then you can essentially take noise out of the signal. Like so there are lots of applications of the singular value decomposition uh, out there. Uh, it's also a great theoretical tool. What we're going to see later in the semester, and we're going to look at just a little bit before, is that how nearly singular, how, how hard AX equals Y is as to solve has to do with how elongated this ellipsoid is in multiple dimensions. Okay, so if, if the ratio between the large singular value and the smaller singular value is very, very large, then solving AX equals Y for X is inherently a really hard problem. Okay, so this, so the singular value decomposition becomes a tool for your lawyer. If your client complains that AX equals B, as AX equals Y didn't give a very accurate solution, then your lawyer will whip out the singular value decomposition, which I think is, isn't it written into the Constitution somewhere? <laughs> as a basic human right. Um, anyway, your lawyer will whip out the singular value decomposition and say, but your problem has a very large ratio between the largest and the smallest singular value. Therefore, the problem is yours, sir. Go away. Okay? So it's a great theoretical tool as well, as we will see. Any questions? So hopefully now you feel really pumped up. You want to learn about the singular value decomposition. Next week we will go through, sorry, not next week, next lecture we will go through the theory. Uh, there are exercises that we will lead you along. And then we will have this great tool to use throughout the rest of the semester. All right, we'll see you on Thursday.